like a table of contents. And here's what I mean. He's going to hit on major topics that tell us what's going to come up in the rest of the book as he's trying to lay out for us Jesus is the Messiah that Jews were waiting for and that Greeks were not waiting for. That's, that's John's entire thesis. He's the Messiah Jews were waiting for and the one that Greeks were not, or non-Jews were not waiting for. And one of the metaphors John likes to use throughout his gospel is the contrast between light and dark. And this is a powerful image, both for somebody who's got a background in Judaism, who has already been taught to view God as the light. Think about it. When Moses is working in that awesome job he always hoped for, known as his father-in-law's employee watching sheep, how does God show up? He is this fiery presence inside a bush, and yet it does not destroy the bush. There's this light, and that same fiery light, it leads Israel. They follow a pillar of fire throughout the wilderness. And then it's time for God to speak and give us the law. And what happens? There's fire, there is light on top of the mountain. And almost 2,000 years later, after Jesus said to his church, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who's going to fill you and empower you, and you're going to do even greater things. What happens? A group of Christians are praying, and that same fire that was on Sinai appears above people. We are Sinai now. Right? There is this light a narrative that was already there. If you had Jewish ears and you're listening 2,000 years ago to John, you already kind of know what he's up to. And because of Plato's cave, you also, if you're not Jewish and you're infected by Greek thought in the first century Palestine, you also have a lot of thoughts about light and dark. Uh, Greek thought about light and dark was what? The shadow and the form, right? If there's a chair that, you know, that you're sitting on, it's not the real chair, there is an ultimate chair somewhere up there in the cosmos, and this is just kind of a shadow of the greater reality. And so John masterfully speaks to people who've been to church their entire life and people who've never been to church. And he does so in the same illustration. We get to explore this amongst a few other illustrations the next seven weeks. Today, uh, the sermon is called The Creator Who Saves. The Creator Who Saves. Uh, Savior and creator are two different roles, and we're going to see them kind of uh, intersect with each other today. So read with me, if you would, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Could you imagine a more brazen Christmas story than that? Hold on, hold on. John is trying to make the case that Jesus is the Messiah Jews were waiting for and the one that the Greeks were not waiting for. And he does not start with the manger and shepherds and wise men. He skips all of these things. You guys are going to have to do it, I think, because it doesn't like my thumb or something. He skips these things. He said he starts his gospel at the beginning of everything. Note takers, grab your pens. Here's your first blank. Isn't it fascinating? He doesn't say an angel came to the shepherds and this is how your Christmas story starts. He doesn't say some wise men saw a star in the east and this is how your Christmas story starts. This is where God jumps into humanity. John says, now this is lost on a Greek philosopher, but the, the, the good Jewish boys and girls who grew up, you know, going and, and, and studying all their verses like they're supposed to, you know, they... Here's something definitive when he starts off with, in the beginning. What is John saying? Oh my goodness, right? If you're new to church, those are the first three words of the Bible. The the first time in what every good Jewish boy and girl would have known, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God hovered over the earth that was dark and formless. And God said, let there be light. Oh, light. Wait, I've heard of this somewhere. Right, because this is where John's going. And what happens? What happens in verse 3 when God says, let there be light? Non-existent entity, non-existent energy light, wrap your head around this, obeys him. 
Light, which does not exist, obeys Yahweh by coming into existence. So things that don't exist obey this God. Anybody here can't do that? Can you make a non-existent thing obey you? Okay, so can we agree then? John, Luke might uh, give us warm fuzzies at Christmas time by talking about shepherds, and there's so much power there. I love that we're seeing God come to the marginalized, but John is making a different statement. He is starting off with a big creator God when he says, in the beginning. This is not the Jesus that gets talked about on Discovery Channel exposés. Right before Christmas, I think it was on the 22nd or the 23rd, I saw, we don't have TV anymore, but I was in my in-law's house, borrow, you know, borrowing their TV, and we go over there, and I saw in the, on the TV Guide channel, Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ, faith, fact, and fiction, and I couldn't even bring myself to click on it. I couldn't even do it, because I've watched enough of these things over the years, and they, and they just, they break my heart. We don't want a Jesus who's this big. That's the reality. We do not want a Jesus who was integral. We're going to see this in the next five verses in particular, verses two, three, and four, really explicit. We don't want a Jesus who is there with the Father and the Son as, a, as one creative God because that gives him rights over everything. I really need him to just be what my professor at Sac State said he was. I just need him to be another nice teacher that got killed. That's so bad. That's so sad, you know? Gosh, that, like, you know, like Gandhi and MLK. It's just so sad. That shouldn't have, right? Jesus was cool. He had some nice things to say. He told us all to chill and be nice to each other, right? A friend of mine through Toastmasters posted a meme not even two weeks ago, and I had to respond to it. It was just a little bit too brazen. It was a meme of a picture of Jesus and all these words of, hey, I just told you guys to be nice to each other and love each other and blah, blah, blah. I didn't tell you to hate each other, blah, blah, blah. And I had to respond to it because it sounds all nice, but really it was still, again, a God of our imagination. The text of the meme presumed that the creator of the meme got to define the word love, got to define the word hate, got to, right? A God who speaks light into existence is not interested in your definition of a word. And he's not interested in mine. And isn't this how good parents behave? Only a wicked parent allows their four-year-old daughter to determine reality. Your six-year-old son wants to play with fireworks inside the house and light them off. Only a wicked parent allows that six-year-old to determine right, wrong, and the definition of the word safe. And yet we here are screaming at God saying we want to define love, we want to define hate, we want to define light, we want to define darkness, and only a wicked God would allow us that much power. We're going to find out he is the light. It's not just a definition, it's who he is. And we're going to have to roll with it. Note takers, here's your next blank. Jesus was before you, therefore he's greater than you. It's true of me too. I could have wrote it as Jesus was before Greg, therefore he is greater than Greg. We're going to hear from Pastor Roy in a few weeks, and I'm, few, I'm really excited about it. We're going to get to the part of the text that talks about John the Baptist. And, and John the Baptist is going to tell us in a few verses, hey, he, talking about Jesus, he is greater than me because he was before me. And the verbiage and the, the structure of the sentence is really explicit. He has always existed. He's not saying, hey, Jesus is a little bit older than me, so he kind of pulls rank here. That's not what he's saying. He is not only Messiah, he has existed as God from eternity past. So everything he says is categorically more important than what I have to say. He, he outranks me. I'm not even worthy to untie the sandal on his feet. If John the Baptist, and Jesus said of John the Baptist, no one born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. So if John the Baptist is that awesome, how does this not apply to me too? When did I come and do I'm not, I'm not going to press on you guys. I want to hurt your feelings and you have to put a helmet on. Oh, let's just talk about Greg. Let's hurt Greg's feelings for a minute. When did Greg come into existence? 
Some of you are going to feel old when I answer the question. A few of the youngins are going to go, oh, he's old. Okay, so I became just more than a gleam in my daddy's eye in 1984. Okay, how many of you can testify? Raise a hand and say 1984 was yesterday. How many, like that was yesterday. You remember in detail, right? Okay. Who am I? If human beings in their 60s and 70s can feel like 1984 was yesterday, what do you think God's perspective of 1984 is? I am so small. That means you are so small. And you know what? I love it that way. The only thing that's terrifying about being small is when you believe that your father is wicked, lazy, or not on the job. That's the only thing that's terrifying about being small. But when you trust a father who's big and who's strong, and has an S on his chest, his cape flaps in the wind, and he's never failed you, being small is beautiful. I get to sleep every night knowing I don't have to make the earth rotate on its axis. He's greater than me. How do I know he's greater than me? Well, at least one argument, because he doesn't have a birthday. I don't, mean to ruin your, I don't mean to ruin your Christmas. How old are you if you don't have a birthday because you've always existed? That means he knows a little bit more than I know. He has a little more wisdom than I have. Like, I have to go and sign up for a college class to learn what the names of all, where the planets are and how to work a good telescope to go look at all these planets or whatever. And he could tell you the molecular structure of the planet because he made it. And if he wants to unmake it, he can make it disappear right before you look. Wait a minute, I thought it was right there. It was, but he, you know. The power differential is breathtaking. Here's what I'd like to submit to you if you're not sure yet what you think exactly of Jesus. Ask yourself this question. What will happen if I abandon the good teacher Jesus of academia to follow the Jesus that John's telling me about? What would happen? Guys, the Jesus that a Sac State professor or that Discovery Channel will tell you about is a weak, small Jesus. He either never got killed or his resurrection was a myth. Like, he's just not that big. He's just not that strong. He's certainly not the light entering the darkness. John, you're such a bigot. How can you say that your God is the light? There are lots of lights, right? We're all just, you know. See, John never heard about the image, the image of the elephant. How many of you guys have heard of the, the Hindu uh, description of four mystics touching an elephant? A few? Okay. So Hinduism teaches, and this is super popular today, that there was one mystic and he, they were all blind. All these mystics were blind. And one felt the tail of the elephant. And he said, oh, an elephant is like a broom. And another mystic was on the side of the elephant and felt this big side. He says, well, no, an elephant is like a wall. And then the other mystics were standing at different parts of the elephant. They all had their own perspectives. And the point of the illustration is to say is that all these religious viewpoints are correct. Well, there's just one problem. How many of you, before I started describing the image, how many of you already knew what an elephant looks like? So the illustration presumes that the person hearing it already knows absolute truth. That's my nice way of saying that illustration is utter baloney. There has to be an objective reality that somebody knows, that somebody created. You have to know everything in order to arrogantly sit there and go, all their perspectives are equal. We have no idea the arrogance that we are sitting in when we go, oh, everything is the light. Everything's work. That religion's good for you. That religion's good for you. That philosophy's good for you. It's all equally true. Devout Judaism doesn't teach that. Mormonism doesn't teach that. Islam doesn't teach that. Christianity does not teach that. Atheism does not teach that. Oprah does. 
I'm not hating on Oprah, but she's just a good visible figurehead of this philosophy. It holds no water. Study Islam. Study it. Read it. Read the Quran. And ask yourself, does Islam allow for other gods to be worshipped equally with Allah? It doesn't. So where did you get this? All right. In the beginning was the word. Let's be honest now. How many of you think that that phrase by itself is as clear as mud? Clear as, in the beginning was the word, and my Bible capitalizes the W. What's going on? So let's take a look at this Greek word that John used, and let's examine how it falls on Jewish ears. Let's examine how it falls on Greek ears. And then we'll get out of here so you can beat the Methodists to the sizzler. Okay. Here's the logos. Logos. This idea, we're going to get more into the Greek idea in a minute. This is not a term that is lost on Jewish ears, even though it's incredibly Greek in its thought. The word. If you were Jewish in the first century and John says, the word, what might that conjure up for you? What's, what's in your mind at this point? In the beginning was the word. Is that controversial for you? The word. That, I'm fine with that as a Jew. Because my God spoke to create. I'm fine with that. Yeah, the word of God was already there. The Old Testament already includes many times where the word of God is going out. It's embodied, it's talked about like it's an entity separate from God and yet it, we're about to find it is God. In the beginning was the word and it was with God and it was God. This is part of the building blocks of Trinitarian theology. God's word goes out and it creates, it does other things throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the beginning was the word, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. But it is interesting. The same God who created the world also died to pay the penalty of my sins. The in the beginning part reminds me, oh yeah, we're talking about the creation. But this is at the beginning of a gospel where this dude John is trying to tell me Jesus is the Messiah. And his argument begins by going back to who I've already acknowledged as a good Jew. I've acknowledged Yahweh as creator. You're saying my creator came and saved me? This is both surprising and not surprising at the same time. How many times did Yahweh save Israel in the first two-thirds of our Bible? <laughs> Yahweh saves Israel. They enjoy the deliverance for a little while. They get comfortable, fat and happy. They start worshiping other gods. He hand, hands them over to other peoples that enslave them. And things go terrible, just like the covenant said. I'm going to hand you over every time you walk away from me. I'm going to walk away from you so that you feel it and you come back to me. Eventually, they've suffered enough. They cry out to God for deliverance, and he delivers them. And the cycle repeats over and over and over. Yes, our creator saves us. Yes, our creator delivers us. And yet, this is controversial. This is weird at the same time to Jewish ears. Because I'm expecting a Jewish Messiah to come and save me, but not everybody in the Jewish world in the first century believed that Messiah was Yahweh. M Messiah's Messiah. He's coming from God. He's holy. He's better than us. He's stronger than us. You know, he's going to be pretty awesome. He's going to be the, the, the Chuck Norris of, of Judaism. But w there was not necessarily agreement. I think it was probably a, a bomb dropped on a, on a lot of people. He will be God himself. Today, in the 21st century hearing of this idea, we have a few issues. One, to acknowledge that somebody created me and therefore has authority over me, I don't like that one bit, right? It's easier to just say God doesn't exist. But that he saved me. See, I, I don't want a Jesus that saves me because then I have to admit guilt. I don't want to be guilty, so I deny spiritual absolute truth like right and wrong. If everybody can be right and everybody can be wrong as by their own definitions, I never have to be guilty, right? I don't want to be guilty. I don't want to feel that way. Because if I'm guilty, then I have to deal with it. Then I have to wrestle with Jesus' claims that he offers forgiveness of sins, which means also that he has authority to forgive sin. Oh, crud. See, none, nothing that Jesus says or that anybody says about him 
allows me to be on the throne of my own life. And that's really my issue. Because you guys are cool and I love you, but I'm awesome. I want a crown on my head. I want a scepter in my hand and I want everybody to obey me all the time. My theology reveals this over and over. I don't want Jesus to be my creator. I don't want him to be my savior. Both of these things have huge implications and they crush my little kingdom that I'm trying to build for myself. This means that Jesus has every right to judge me, but chooses to love me instead. He has every right to judge me, but chooses to love me instead, for you note takers. If you've been in church for a while, you remember a story of a woman who is caught in the act of adultery and the religious elite grab her and throw her at Jesus' feet and say, hey, Law of Moses says we should stone her to death right now. Jesus, what do you think? What do you say? This poor woman had never been treated worse in her entire life because she is now just a pawn in a religious game. They don't care about her. They don't even care about her guilt. They're trying to trap Jesus. If he takes the route of mercy and says, have mercy on her, he is now rejecting Moses and they could have a riot on their hands as a bunch of devout Jews call Jesus a heretic. And if he says, endorses the law and says, yeah, stone her to death, he is now guilty of breaking Roman law because only the Romans were allowed to execute. They're trying to put Jesus in a lose-lose situation, except, shocker, he's smarter than them. <laughs> All right, but whoever has no sin, throw the first stone. I grew up, now you guys are smart, but I'm dull. I grew up hearing this story in church over and over again, and I never pieced together the most important reality of this story. These devout Jews who have rocks in their hands drop their stones one at a time, oldest first, down to the youngest, and walk away because they know that they are not without sin. But, but you know what I never picked up growing up? Do you know there's one person who does not walk away? Let he who has no sin cast the first stone, and Jesus just stands there. So he's either arrogant as all get out, or he's actually a sinless Messiah. Woman, where are your accusers? He's just made a statement about himself. I am not your accuser, because I'm here. They're gone, sir. Neither do I condemn you. Oh, so Jesus doesn't care about right and wrong then. He just said that, right? Neither do I condemn you. Oh, wait, but except there's a back half of the sentence. Go and sin no more. There's nothing more powerful than a God who knows right and wrong because he is the definition of right and wrong. And he's willing to say in the same breath, you have done wrong. I choose not to condemn you because I know that I'm about to go to a cross. You don't know that. Here in a puddle of snot and tears in the dirt, probably naked in front of everybody, you don't know what I'm about to suffer. But he has the right to forgive because he's going to pay the price of that woman's sin himself. So God is both merciful and just at the same time. I'm going to be merciful on you because I'm going to pay the justice of the penalty of your sins myself. You couldn't ask for a God this good. Ask yourself this, whether you love Jesus or not. What is stopping me from feeling the mercy of God? Small sins or a small savior? What is stopping me from feeling the mercy of God? Small sins or a small savior? Is it my sins just really aren't that big of a deal? Or Jesus isn't a very big deal. He's not strong enough. He's not capable enough. Either of these will stop us from feeling what that woman probably felt when he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Well, let's talk about logos to Greek ears. This is from Aristotle. The logos, or speech, or reason, is designed to distinguish... Go ahead and go to the next slide. Is, dis, is designed to distinguish the beneficial from the harmful and thus also the right from the wrong. Interesting. So this is, this is 
not outside of Bible, outside of religion, Greek philosophical thought of what the Logos is. Distinguishes right from wrong. For this, in distinction from the other animals, is the distinctive property of man, that he alone has the ability to perceive good and bad and right and wrong and the other qualities. And it is communication of these things that makes a household and a city-state. He's saying the Logos is the foundation of what allows human civilization to even function. It is this mythical force out there that only humanity can get in touch with. The animals can't get in touch with it. And it allows us to distinguish between right and wrong. Where do, like, between light and dark. John's just masterful. He said, in the beginning was the word, the reason, the logos, all knowledge. If you're my age or younger, we tend to view Google this way. You don't know it? Google it. It has all knowledge. Do you ever stop and think, did you realize? I don't, but we're really honest. Google only knows what we tell it. Somebody has to put in information for Google to search it. And how, how many of you know that you can ask a question of Google and get an answer that's not correct? Right. Why? Because fallible human beings input the information in the first place. Aristotle says only human beings have the ability to get in touch with this mythical force. I feel like I've heard that word somewhere before. Didn't Yoda teach Luke Skywalker about something like this? There's a light side. There's a dark side. You have to get in touch with it. This is a little bit, it's not perfect, but this is a little bit of the Greek approach to the Logos. And John says to the Star Wars nerds, the force put on flesh and made his dwelling among us. The force is not something that you get in touch with so that you can manipulate and use it the way Yoda told you to lift an X-wing out of a swamp. You, he will not be used because he is not just this feeling. He created everything. Whatever would happen to the Star Wars universe if the force took on flesh and became one character... There's no fight. That would ruin the story. You can't have a lightsaber duel with the force because you're going to lose, right? <laughs> and this is what John is getting at, the Greek logos. All knowledge, all wisdom that Greeks think they can chase after discussing in the Areopagus all day long. Let's find the wisest ideas. Let's find the best ideas. How do we do economics? How do we relationships between slaves and masters? How do we do governments? How do we do relationships between men and women? All of your best ideas, forget them. The logos, what, the source of all, nor, of all knowledge, the form, the, sh the form that allows you to chase after shadows, the form took on flesh and lived among human beings. It's like John says to the Greek, for you note takers, the cosmic source of ethics became a person. You already believe in this Hard to define source of everything that's right and wrong. And that became a person. He created you. You rejected him. But he died to save you anyway. Because he's not impersonal. He took on flesh. He's not just floating out there. He is here with us. God with us. Emmanuel. And he apparently loves you because he made himself the sacrifice to pay for your wrongdoing against him. So the Logos you already believe in, the truth is actually way, way better. Think of the religion of the people that are studying a word like Logos. The highest and best that they have is Zeus. And Zeus is a jerk. I don't know if you've ever studied or watched any of the movies. He's a, you look up jerk on Wikipedia, there's a picture of Zeus. He, he only cares about himself. And John speaks into this Greco-Roman world I've got something better for you than Zeus. The Logos is God himself, and he created you, and he died for you. John does not pull any punches saying, I have a truth for you, capital T, and he is better than what you currently believe. 
And this is why we as Christians, those of us who love Jesus, we get accused of arrogance all the time. Um, Don't wait for me to shy away. You can call it arrogance, but you don't get to define the word arrogance. Yahweh does. Yahweh is telling you that you are being arrogant if you would scream in his face, liar! You and I do not get to call God liar. We don't. It's not our place. It's not our role. We who lie all the time, we who self-deceive, crying out liar to the one who's never told a lie. Mm -mm. So John does not pull punches in saying, I know the light, he's a person, and I want you to know about him. This is where his gospel starts. Now this is going to be hard with that. Could you click? This is going to be really tough without this clicker. Can anybody tell me who these guys are? Okay, Tonto and the Lone Ranger. So give me a, a definition in one word. What, what is Tonto? He's a sidekick. Can you guys give me the next picture? Who are, the, who are these guys? Yogi and Boo Boo. What is Boo Boo? He's a sidekick. Okay, who's the, who's the next guy here? <laughs> Mini Me. What is Mini Me? He's a sidekick. Okay, what about this next one? <laughs> Donkey! Anybody remember the Shrek movies? What is Donkey? Sidekick. He's a sidekick. Okay, what about this guy? It's a me, Mario. What's Luigi? He's a sidekick. What about this guy? Sidekick. Uh, An important question, and this is how we're going to end today. Ask yourself this question. Am I treating Jesus as my sovereign, or is he my sidekick? You see, the leading role when a sidekick is present is called a hero. Is he sovereign over my existence or is he my sidekick? You see, this is a critical question no matter where you're at in faith. If you've loved Jesus for a long time, there's a temptation to make Jesus our sidekick. I have an agenda. I have plans. I have dreams. I've got a five-year plan for our finances. Our family's going to do this. I'm going to do this at my work. I'm going to do this and do that. Dear Lord Jesus, would you please bless all of my awesome plans? Amen. That's how a Christian makes Jesus a sidekick. That's very different than getting on your face and saying, God, what do you want? Whatever you want is what I want. What do you want? And if you're not a Christian and you're exploring who Jesus is, exploring the Bible, this question is for you too. I want you to know that a God who is small enough to be your sidekick cannot save you. He cannot wash away sin. He cannot defeat Satan, sin, and death by himself. If you can give him orders, if you can tell him what to do, he's too small. He's too small. We like to end our time in the Word each week with a bit of time to think and pray. I'm going to give us a moment or two. I want to ask you, if you've got a pen, jot down your takeaway. If God spoke to you today, Write down what he said to you, what he's telling you to do, the step he's taking you to, asking you to take. Those of you who have signed up or are going to sign up for a disciple group, you're going to have a chance to take what you heard today and maybe just share it with your group this week when you're with them. The whole point of a disciple group is that your journey in Christ not be alone. You have others who will journey with you. So maybe share with somebody quietly during this time. Maybe share with your disciple group later this week. This is a chance to pray and say, what did God say? No one cares what Greg said, right? No one cares. But if God said something in the moment that was for you, write it down and share it with somebody so you don't forget it. We do not want to be like those that look in a mirror and walk away, forget what our face looks like, James says. All right? So let's take a moment to think, to respond to God, and I'll come up in a moment to dismiss us.
God, would you please move powerfully in each of our hearts individually and in our communal heart as a church family? God, we confess that unless you step in, this is just a kind of an intellectual exercise in trying to be good. And we do not want that, God. We want to be transformed by you, God. So we ask you to take hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh, soft, ready to listen to you, to love you, to trust you. God, we confess that every single day sin tempts us to make you smaller than you actually are. And we thank you for being a big God so that your big heart can deliver big results to big sinners like us. We thank you for your cross, Jesus. We thank you for the empty tomb. And we thank you for faithful servants like John who do not hold back in telling us exactly who you are. In the powerful name of Jesus, God's people said, amen. amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.